expose the ways in which Satan tries to infiltrate our lives and equip believers to successfully contend with it. Hey friends, this is Brandon Spain, and you're listening to The Unrefined Podcast, where we unravel mysteries, share perspectives, and navigate the rich landscapes of the seen and unseen together. We would love for you to connect with us on social media. You can find those links and how to subscribe to our members-only exclusive portal by visiting unrefinedpodcast.com. Now, for this week's episode. Hey, 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 you guys. This week, we are delving into the, the topic of the demonic and spiritual warfare. We have a super guest here today. We've read his book, and it's coming out soon. He can tell us more about that later on. But, uh, man, it was an, uh, amazing when demons surface. And we're going to go into that book and talk about, you know, pretty much whatever the Holy Spirit wants us to talk about today, but hopefully in that vein. But before we dive into that, introduce him um, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Lindsay Waters and BT Wallace. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Our guest today is a retired senior military chaplain, a graduate of a Gordon Cornwall Seminary. His combined personal and pastoral encounters with demons bring practical significance to his theological training. His desire is to equip the modern church for battle by helping us to see beyond the veil which is really interesting because that's one of our things, seeing Beyond the Veil. We want to introduce you to his new book, When Demons Surface, and talk about that. So, wow. Thank you so much, Steve, for being here. Can I call you Steve? Is that okay? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You know, we call Jesus by his first name. You can call me <laughs> by mine as well. All right. You're my kind of guy. Yep, 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 yep. I'm actually formerly a, quote, Anglican priest, and I don't go by father at all. So, <laughs> but... um. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, we want to hear a little bit about your background. Can you tell us about your journey that led you to focus on spiritual warfare and prayer? I mean, you were a chaplain in the military, and so, yeah, just just kind of give us a little background, a little testimony about that, if you can, if that's all right. Oh, absolutely. You know, I grew up in a Christian home, but it wasn't a biblical home. Mm. And, and so I was baptized when I was eight years old, uh, but nevertheless, uh, still, uh, we kind of stopped going to church. And so around age 16, I had a, a guy, he became my best friend in high school and he uh, kept, we worked together and he was my ride to and from work. And so every Saturday night, I, I was really, really upset when he would uh, actually come to me and say, hey, you want to go to church with me in the morning? And so I would always turn him down. And mm -hmm. so he, uh, he got smart one day. He said, hey, my, my church is where uh, all the high school girls go. I said, well, why didn't you tell me that in the first place? <laughs> Count me in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, I, he picked me up that morning. We went to church, and I'm like, well, well, well lo and behold, uh, man, this is where many of the high school girls go. And shortly after that, I just felt God tugging on my heart. I need to submit my life to him. I need to rededicate my life. And I really got upset. It was a Saturday right before going to work. And I remember going in my bedroom and I pointed my, my hand to the ceiling. Uh, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give up this sin, this sin, and this sin, but I reserve the right to chase girls. Mm -hmm. And I said, now you think about that. That's what I told God. And that was pretty much the extent of my theology. I, I walked out of the room, slammed the door behind me, and I left God in there to think about it. And so that night I came home from work, took a shower, laid my clothes out for church, went to bed. And around three o'clock in the morning, I had a vision. And the reason why I know the time is I kept a clock on the other side of the bedroom. That way, when the alarm went off, I wouldn't miss the bus. It would have forced me to get out of the bed, turn it off, and I would be, wouldn't miss the bus. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I see myself in this vision. I'm in an X-rated uh, activity with a young, uh, beautiful young lady. And all of a sudden, the girl disappeared, the bed disappeared, the floor opened up like a trap door, and I, was, I fell into a lake of fire, and I was awakened by my tormented screams. Mm. And so in the middle of that night, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, pitch dark in my room, uh, God was pretty much telling me, no deal. And so I sat up in my bed, I rededicated my life to Christ, and I've been, since the age of 16... <laughs> I, I kissed dating goodbye and <laughs> mm. I had post-traumatic stress disorder from dating, you know, for dating. And, uh, 
and I've been committed uh, to the Lord uh, ever since, since age of 16. So I uh, went into full-time ministry, got an undergrad in biblical studies at Laterno University, uh, and of course entered the, uh, the cha- Air Force chaplaincy and served 35 years in the military, 35 years plus in, in ministry now. And so I'm just grateful. I'm an unworthy servant. I'm just grateful to be God would give me the honor to to do this work. I never saw this day coming, never saw this book coming. Um, but I'm just grateful uh, to tell my story. And, and of course, um, after I submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's when I started having paranormal disturbances in my bedroom. Hmm. And then, in, of course, in ministry, when I would do counseling, I would bump into a myriad of people from every walk of life, every background that were having supernatural encounters, demonic attacks. And I said, hey, this is too, too, I've been dealing too prevalently with this in my ministry and I need to make sure that I I tell the story and and, and equip, you know, expose the ways in which Satan tries to infiltrate our lives and equip believers to successfully contend with him. That's my intent. Yeah, I would like to go into the stories like later on in the podcast, uh, cause I have a really kind of a special question for you about that. Uh, but before we just really dive into that, I just have some, just some basic warfare, you know, spiritual warfare, demonic type questions. And I'm sure my guys here will, will too. But the, the first thing I wanted to ask you is what are some of the common misconceptions and maybe we need to go before we do this but what are, what are some of the common misconceptions about spiritual warfare i mean i'm a uh, i agree with your whole you know mo- most all of your book my wife and i sandy have been doing deliverance and healing prayer for years and uh been trained by different people and, and even before i was ordained a priest i was part of the vineyard movement and stuff and so we know the gifts and this is a gift friendly podcast definitely so, but, uh, what, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. I don't know. I've been a Christian for 30 years and, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff coming out recently in, in the deliverance world of people arguing whether a Christian can have a demon and all this kind of stuff, which didn't Absolutely. exist back 30 years ago. I mean, we just knew if somebody manifested, you did something to it and you mm. don't, it, well, you, you didn't care whether it was on your shoulder and your back and your heart. I mean, it, it didn't matter. You know, you dealt with it. And uh, anyway, so that was a huge thing that when I was looking at this question, I was thinking about, but I want you to take this wherever you want to go. What are some of the common misconceptions about spiritual warfare? The first that comes to mind to me is that, um, most common because, of course, being in ministry and, uh, you know, I'm senior, retired as a senior chaplain. So most of the, my latter years, I, I pretty much supervise clergy. Yeah. And it's not uncommon to bump into folks that don't believe that Christians can be attacked. Yeah. And so that's, that's always a shock to me. And I have to always remind them, I said, if, if Christians cannot be attacked, then why does the Bible tell us on three separate occasions that we need to put on the full armor of God. Or your enemy is a roaring lion looking who he may devour. I mean, right there. Boom. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have people that oftentimes they say, well, God is our refuge. I said, well, finish quoting that. He's our <laughs> refuge and strength and an ever-present help in times of what? Trouble. Yeah, trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yeah. you know, I have to help them finish the, the quote. But uh, so that's the most common misconception I have. I, I think you brought up the whole idea of can Christians be demonized? I have a chapter in the book on that. And I do a lot of extensive research and analysis in that. And I, I approach it from a Judaic mindset. Yeah. I approach it from a theological, historical, biblical. I analyze Hebrew, Greek terms, all of that. Yeah, and very so thorough. the biggest thing I can tell people, of course, they can get it in the book. And this is where they'd have to do a little. I encourage them to really have an open mind and really, really consider uh, the history. There is nothing. Uh, C. Fred Dickinson wrote a book, Christian and Demon Possession. Mm-hmm. Um, and pretty much one of the things he he articulately expresses and shows and demonstrates in the book is that there is no biblical reference in the New Testament that says a Christian cannot be demonized. 
And also what we find in history that they give examples or historical testimony of Christians actually being demonized. Yeah. So the Bible doesn't say we can't, and the uh, history says we can. And oh, so yeah. this is where the, uh, the modern day church has to re-examine that because that for, the, for nearly 2,000 years in Christian church history, uh, we have examples of Christians being demonized. And, and the best way I can I tell them, they have to look at the terms. Um, uh, and basically, when the Bible talks about testimony, it actually has the, it speaks of it as the words from a, a witness, a historian. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of folks may look at the church history and say, well, you know, we, there are a lot of things we disagree with. But I try to remind them, I said, there was once a, a Christian chaplain, a Muslim chaplain, and a Hindu chaplain. Wow. <laughs> you know, and they hear a big wreck out front, loud noise, and they run out and they see a car on fire. And the news uh, anchor comes and, and, and she asks questions, you know, will their testimony be discounted based on their religious background? Or can it be said that regardless of the religious background, they all saw and heard the same thing? And so I would say that even when we look at church history, whether we agree with uh, some aspects of it, one of the things that uh, the writers in, in, in the early church, they gave a testimony of what they saw and it, they gave examples of, the, of Christians being demonized. And that to me uh, yes. is something that has to be contended with and, and analyzed. That's totally different. Uh, and someone's interpretation of scripture is totally that's a whole new, different uh, category than what a person saw and heard with their eyes and ears. And so testimony and interpretation are two different things. And so that's what I tell people to do. Steve, could you yes. like back up and like, we've probably talked about this distinction before, but just in case for some of our listeners who aren't familiar with it, just give us a rundown of the term demonized as maybe opposed to some of the more familiar terms like oppressed, possessed, and and things like that. Yeah. I, uh, a lot of people get confused uh, with the uh, word possessed because it's not found in the Bible. The word oppressed, mm-hmm. all those terms, those are not terms we find in the Bible. The yeah. only term we find in the Bible is the Greek word that says that this pretty much the English translation is demonized. So we don't find that a person was demonically possessed. That word is not used. Uh, it's actually, it's a one, it's only one word and it's demonized. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I, I, matter of fact, I think it was St. Augustine that we find used that, that term. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It could have been, forgive me. I, I believe Josephus may have been the one that we find the term used mm-hmm. and we, it became popular in our modern day. Uh, throughout history, but that the word possessed. Now, with that said, if possessed means inhabited, then, then it would actually be an accurate ex- expression. Mm-hmm. But if possessed means ownership, that's where it, it becomes very confusing. Yeah, that's but, really good. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we even um, so with that said, people talk about influenced, oppressed, possessed. And I would say, simply speaking, those words are not used in the scriptures when we mm-hmm. when we when it refers yeah. to a person. The only word that it, it it is used is demonized, and that can be done on different levels. A person can be demonized on a very low or mild level, all the way to an extreme strong. It's like level. a it's like a spectrum, right? Like like yeah, like the autistic spectrum or or ADHD spectrum. It, it's it's on a spectrum like that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how I would see it. Not what. That's what surprised me when I started getting back into the podcast world and a lot of out there that this this argument is happening. It was like, no, when I cut my teeth on Derek Prince and stuff like that, you cast out a demon out of whoever in front of you has a demonic problem. It didn't matter who they are. And then I, I'm very familiar with a, a lot of the stuff in 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 that Catholic Church being Anglican. And I know a, lo- a lot of that when they do an, a rite of exorcism on a Catholic, they consider that person a Christian. So it, but it's, it, it, I mean, they don't have much choice but to do deliverance from from a Christian. Uh, 
And then there was a guy back in the, he was German back in the 1800s. And and I know Lindsay can remember his name. Is it Bloomhart? Lindsay? Yeah, probably Bloomhart. Yeah. And and, yeah, that was it. Bloomhart. Yeah, and all his people in his little town that they were fighting the plague or something, and and uh, he had a no, it was a girl, and he had the demon came out. It said Christ is Victor, really loud, and, and I mean she was a member of his church. So yeah, I just uh, I just I often wonder if this is the enemy's. You know, he he's the master of confusion. We can see that right now, and just everywhere, and and uh, I, I just see him liking to get us like arguing over something, you know, not even collegial, just so elementary back and forth that should have been and has been taken care of years ago. So what do you think about that, Steve? Well, you know, uh, while I was uh, on active duty in the military, I had a chance to have the honor of, of going, the Air Force sending me to school for a year, and I have a master's degree in military operational art and science. Wow. And I could tell you that we study war, literally, and we love confusing the enemy. Mm. And so if I can understand it from a human point of view, then if I was Satan or a demon, that's exactly what I would do. Exactly. But Jesus tells us in, in Luke 9 and 1 that he, is, that he himself has given us authority and power mm-hmm. over evil spirits. Well, the last thing I want is a Christian to know that and believe it. And so... It would deal, it would it would hinder greatly my work to deceive and to destroy. Uh, and so there's no doubt in my mind that the biggest issue we have three we have thirty three thousand denominations and counting in, in in America. So every time we split and have another denomination, then we're that further removed from the roots of our our Christian faith. And so when a, if a person doesn't go back and study their history, then they're not going to even believe that these things can happen or how to a, appropriately address them. So that's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that the evil one would want to keep us divided on this issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what's, so, what's so crazy is it's, uh, it's really prevalent in what I call the Protestant evangelical kind of charismatic, which is where I am, too. It, it's really prevalent there. He, he's like sown mass confusion in in that that area and and i agree that false teachers and false prophets and all that need to be dealt with and everything but i think a lot of times we're just a lot of it's just we're shooting our wounded or we're shooting you know uh people that are down and and uh um i mean i'm not talking about people that need to be church discipline not not that at all but just like just from different beliefs different doctrinal things that are not major deal breaker issues so yeah, and I would say, uh, if, if I may add to that, uh, sure. many of the, I, I share over 50 stories, true stories in, in the book, and I had to get a lot of people to give me written permission to use their stories. Some decided to allow me to use their first names. Others decided to have me use an a alias. And, and these are Christians that, that were demonized, and mm-hmm. they know it. And mm-hmm. the book won't say it, but some of these are senior pastors. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, so yeah. so uh, all, so although people may read some of these stories, they may not know that uh, I do a lot to maintain the anonymity of the people. But some yes, of sir. these people in the book are pastors. Some are senior pastors. And so when they give in their stories and, and they talk about how they were demonized, then I would encourage every believer when they read these stories to say, by what basis are you going to make a judgment as to whether or not they were not Christians? Exactly. And we so can't judge it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, very sobering reality. And so um, I, I, I guarantee you when they read the stories, they, they will walk away very encouraged, inspired, or really sobered by the reality of spiritual warfare. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to move on to the more practical aspects of uh, this. If, if somebody reads your book and they want to go to the, the next steps, because I want to save the stories for last, because that's what I'm really excited about. Uh, what What are some um, like examples? Uh, how does your spirituality or your your routine, your prayer life, your scripture life, your devotional life? How, how does all that in fasting? That's a huge one to me. How does all that 
factor into to what you do and what you've been doing? Well, I can tell you this, that uh, a lot of times when people read the book or they read a story or they uh, listen to some of the aspects, because uh, I've been very open. I start with my, you know, I believe everything starts at, your, at, at home. And so mm. I've actually been yes. very, very, uh, I've labored steadfastly to talk to my family about uh, about these matters, even before they were in the book. And so I tell people, if you practice the four disciplines that we find in Acts 2.42, it would greatly lessen your demonic attacks or should I say your spiritual warfare. There's no way around the fact that we're going to be attacked no more than we can get away from in, in being in our, we got the, the U S has the greatest military in the world, but it still does not prevent us from being attacked on occasion by our enemies. Absolutely. And so Jesus won the victory for us on the cross, but it still does not alleviate that we're going to be attacked as Christians. So I would say that your spiritual warfare intrusions are greatly lessened if you're following the four disciplines of Acts 2.42 that are demonstrated by the first Christians. And so the first would be you need to be attending church weekly. Every Sunday, the first day of the week, we celebrate the resurrection. We need to be assembled with other believers celebrating the resurrection. That's the first thing. Secondly, we need to be devoted to the apostles' teachings. Of course, that the equivalent, modern day equivalency of that is to we need to be reading our Bibles. The prophet Hosea bemoaned, uh, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And he didn't say lack of fasting, lack of not doing good. He said lack of knowledge. So yeah. we need to be familiar with the word of God. And so, for, so firstly, we need to be in church uh, every Sunday assembled with other believers celebrating the resurrection. We need to be reading our Bibles regularly. We need to be fellowshipping with other Christians. It's mm -hmm. amazing. There's an old church history quote that says that our temptations are lessened the more we are in fellowship with other believers. It's a common fact where our bond is, is there's strength in numbers. And the more we fellowship or we're around other Christians, then they edify and encourage us. And then the fourth one, it says, and to, and it's interesting in the Greek, it says the prayer. Mm. And that I go into that in the third chapter, because I believe that reference with the article in front of it is referring to the Lord's prayer. Oh yeah. This is great. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. uh, we wanted to go there because uh, uh, when we were reading the book, I've started practicing, Steve, you'll be proud of me. I I've started practicing three times a day, at least. And, and give you a hand of round of applause. Yeah, well, yeah, I know. I know. Well, what's so crazy though, Steve, is I'm an Anglican priest. We it's all in our liturgy that when, yep. when it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. But yet, for some reason, when I was reading your book, it had an impact. The Holy Spirit used it to make a real impact, even in, in seminary. It was a model prayer. And and I know there is a place for that. That's not entirely false. But but it's like I remember there's a guy named Larry Lee years ago wrote a book, Can You Not Tarry One Hour? And he took that prayer and he tore it apart and he it was all good stuff. But you really and, and BT and I discussed it this week, uh really made me begin to think and stirred up everything inside of me about okay, I don't want to be I don't want it to be a rope prayer. And so me and BT talked about what rope prayers were and stuff. I want I didn't want to be superstitious about it, but I wanted to say it with feeling and meaning and intent. And so that's what I've been really trying to do when I've been reciting the prayer. Lindsay, did you have something you want to say? No, I just wanted to agree, man, to agree that the, the Lord's prayer part was worth the price of admission here, so to speak. I, I really enjoyed that too. I've been trying to work that back into my prayer life. Been a little inconsistent, so pray for me. But um, yeah, it it just I had that same problem with what I always called canned prayers, mm -hmm. and and took it to an extreme, and that that helped kind of bring me back not to the middle, but to the scriptures. And like, mm -hmm. does it really sound like he's saying you're not allowed to ever repeat this in there? So yeah, that, that was a yeah. good part. Yeah. Well, the benefit that one of the things that I loved about being a military chaplain is that I had a chance to work shoulder to shoulder with people from all religious backgrounds for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so many of my friends, I have friends that are Jewish. Uh, matter mm -hmm. of fact, as I was writing some of the book, I would actually filter some of it through my rabbi friend. And so um, with that said, I can tell you that one of the things they do 
in their prayer times is that they have they use posturing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've began to do is the first part of the Lord's Prayer that I, I actually look, you know, look towards heaven. And then the second part of that, when I'm asking for the requests, I kind of look, look in the palm of my hand in humility. Mm. And then I raise my hands in praise for the, for the latter part. And that has made it much more uh, meaningful when you add the, the postures. I, of course, I have a real b uh, bad back, uh, injured myself in the military. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I can't do the bending and, <laughs> and kneeling and, uh, you know, bowing. So I just do hand postures, but whatever works for you, that's, Ju that's a Judaic practice is to try to take that prayer and, and make it uh, meaningful in, in any way that um, is beneficial to you as, as a, a believer, as you're expressing your dependence and submission to Christ. And so I, I would say that, uh, and of course, I'll let you guys ask some questions about that uh, and I'll dev in accordingly, but I'm glad to hear that uh, that was meaningful to you. Oh, very. And, uh, you know, you just used one of the explanations, apologia, I guess would be a good word to say it, for people who, oh, I'm a Christian and I do yoga. I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody out there, get over it. Anyway, so, all right, yoga is worship postures. Yep. Just like we all have worship postures in our various religions, denominations. I mean, it, it, it cracks me up uh we used to joke, we, we could always tell that the non-Anglicans or the non-Catholics, because they didn't know when to stand and kneel, stand and kneel, stand and kneel. You know, it, was, it was a joke. But that the whole liturgical aspect of Christianity really takes into account the senses and the bodiness and the whole bodiness of our faith, that it's not just spiritual, we're not Gnostics, but we're also physical. And I, I, I thought it was really great what you said about that posture and I'm probably going to start doing it just because e even though I'm not um, uh, like an Anglo Catholic or anything like that, I still do the sign of the cross. It's powerful. It, it means something to me. It, 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 I feel blessed when I do it. And, and you know, there's just all kinds of posture rituals. And then somebody's going to say, Oh, yoga is just stretching. No, not when you look like a Cobra, which I've seen demonic people do with demons uh, across the floor. Mm -hmm. it, 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 so, Take that argument to somebody else that might buy it, but I ain't buying it here. So what do you think about that? Uh, I'm definitely, uh, I'm, I'm all for, I would say this, my colleagues, whoever will listen to this, they'll chuckle when I say this, but I have a Baptist background, but none of my friends considered me, ba I, I just didn't appear as such. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people I'm a flexible Baptist. And so pretty much when my friends talk to me uh, and we talk theology and we talk exegesis, uh, Bible study, yeah. hermeneutics, all those things, I don't sound, they, they tell me I don't sound like I'm anything. I just yeah. sound Christian. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so I would say that one of the benefits of getting my undergrad in biblical studies is that when I went to seminary, I was able to take advanced courses. So I took advanced courses in, in Hebrew exegesis, Greek exegesis and then church history. Mm. And so it was, and, and I can tell you what really did it for me is I said, okay, what was before the Baptist church? Okay. What was before the Protestant Reformation? Mm -hmm. Okay. What was before Pentecost? What was, when I went all the way back to Judaism and I started from mm -hmm. there and I moved my way forward. And the, probably I would, I would say that the best words I can describe is that I was greatly disappointed uh, how we have allowed the evil one to divide us. Is it mm. not Jesus who told us and, and he cried out to the father, Lord, I pray that you would keep them as one, one as we just are. as we are one. Mm -hmm. And so 17. the division that yep. we see in the church is very, I believe it grieves God and, and yes. it cuts us off from our heritage. And a lot of things that we want to say is Catholic or Protestant or Baptist or Methodist or whatever, yeah. Uh, when we even by making those expressions, then we are also expressing indirectly our division. And yeah. so those things yeah. have hurt us. And, and uh, I think if all it takes is whoever is listening to this, I encourage you to go back and study your early church history, study the history of your people, and you will be, it will lead you towards unity. Mm, yeah. Start with Second Temple Judaism and move on into the the fathers. That would be my 
I, and that's what you're saying, basically, right? Yep. Absolutely. And I would say even including that, the Mishnah, the Talmud. Uh, uh, matter of fact, in the book, you'll see a lot of quotes from the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I go all the way back. I study. Uh, matter of fact, I even reached out to a professor at Tel Aviv University in Israel because hmm. he did some studies in his archaeological findings and finding of uh, uh, ancient prayers of binding and, and expelling demons. And it was rich. Uh, matter of fact, at one point, he says Judaism, early Judaism was full of demons. And so. Well, you know, it's really interesting. I've been trying to find that since I saw that in the book actually sent a picture to BT up here saying, where can we find, you know, because, I mean, things like that aren't very commonplace. Um, I don't know if it's online somewhere or something like that, but I, I was like so wanting to find that that uh, Jewish exorcist prayer uh, just, just to read it. And I'm not a big Chosen fan or anything. I mean, I don't think it's bad either way. It's, it, it has some good stuff. But uh, I remember in the first season when they were trying, uh, I think it was Nicodemus was trying to cast out the... Uh, Spirits out of Mary Magdalene. Have you seen that, Steve? Have you seen that at all? I haven't. You know, this, the, the sad thing is uh, <laughs> getting the manuscript done for this book. I had to fast from TV. So I oh, haven't had a chance yeah, to watch well, a lot of yeah. television in the past year. And, and you know, uh, interesting enough, the book manuscript, the contract that I had with Baker Books is that I would do 50,000 words. And I wound up writing like 60,000. So I had to take about 10,000 words out, mm, wow. uh, you know, out of the book uh, and, and, and actually do a lot to make it kind of light. So I didn't get a chance to do a lot of TV watching, but uh, but I because I was just so committed to making sure that I was a good steward of this, this yes. uh, book project. Yes. Well, and I'll tell you this little part, and, and this is a perfect segue for the next place we want to go. Uh, yeah, Nicodemus, to spoil it for you, spoilers, it, this is before Jesus entered the picture in the show. He uh, tried to do an exorcist-type thing on, uh, um, I think it was Mary Magdalene, and it was like in the name of the Watchers and, and you know, all this extra second tipple. So whoever did it did some re pretty decent research into exorcist practice among the among Judaism. It was it was really interesting to hear uh, in a TV show, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, But what I really am I'm kind of looking forward to, you know, you had so much room in your book. You just told us you had 50,000 words and, and you, you really had 60. Let's we'll be honest. And so what are the stories that didn't make the cut? Okay. I mean, the stories in there are great, but you had to choose which ones. And, and I know there, there had to have been, Steve, some that were, oh, I really want to put that in there, but I got to put this other one in there. Can you tell us any of those stories? We can wrap up with that. Oh, well, I mean, it's it's several. I mean, I, I, let me just, I have to think about them all. Tell I them. Mean, tell them. Uh, one was with my testimony. I shared how I, uh, what I would do is I have an evangelistic heart. Mm -hmm. And so every time I was in any circle, I would share my, I would share my testimony. And you'd be, you would think, hey, is the, is the military context really appropriate? to be sharing your, your testimony, how you had this vision of, you know, falling into the lake of fire. I had some interesting responses to it. One particular time, I had a high ranking uh, general. When everybody uh, left the circle of, of discussion, he pulled me to the side. He says, hey, I know exactly how you felt. Wow. And I, he said, I, and I said, well, I looked at him, I said, well, sir, what do you mean? He says, well, Pretty much during uh, when when uh, the Russians were a uh, Soviet Union were doing moon launches, uh, we did radio intercepts and we had a radio intercept of one of their astronauts coming through the atmosphere, burning up in the flames uh, because the capsule a capsule failed. Oh, wow. And he said that uh, I heard this guy burning up in the flames of the Earth's atmosphere. And he said that. Uh, I now have VA bona fide post-traumatic stress disorder by overhearing another man burning up. And he says, I can only imagine what you went through hearing yourself burning in the flames of hell. Hmm. So another story I share, and my, one of my endorsers said, hey, you need to get this in the book. I didn't get a chance to get it in the book. 
But the first month when I started writing, my wife was sitting at a stoplight and a guy was was texting and he was doing like 50 miles an hour. He rear ended her, pushed her underneath another car in front of her, totaled out the car. Mm. Uh, then I, you know, made sure she was OK, you know, retrieved her, got her to medical care, et cetera. As soon mm-hmm. as I got her settled. Uh, my daughter was was driving to work one day, a car, another SUV shot out of nowhere, hit her head on, pushed her into a field, totaled her car. And so that's two. My son was over uh, to the house helping my wife because she had medical problems from that wreck. He was going home uh, and it was exiting off the highway. It was a truck that was in another lane, adjacent lane to him, was about to exit as well. And so he was um, exiting off. I guess the truck didn't see him. It came in on him, pushed him into the curb, and then pushed him out into a field. Uh, So that was the third car that was totaled. Uh, My other son, you know, we have six children, uh, and five of our children are are in their 20s. And so uh, my other son, he was a therapist on his way to work, uh, had a, 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 I don't know how it happened, but his car, uh, ran into uh, somehow another, I don't know if it geared out of control or what, but he lost control of the vehicle and it hit uh, the the barrels in front of the, the exit and he totaled his car. And so uh, every time I would continue to write that uh, these are the types of attacks that we would have. And so then I was on the tollway uh, during the time where it wasn't any traffic. It was only three cars on the tollway, me and, and a, 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 another car and a, a truck that, that was carrying furniture in an open bay. And mm-hmm. I was in the fast lane and I knew I was doing at least uh, the speed limit was 75. So I was doing at least 80 miles an hour. The truck was in the slow lane and he was just speeding and speeding and speeding. And he had to do at least 90 miles an hour to get. I don't know why he got out of the slow lane did about 90 miles an hour just to pull in front of me. And so as soon as he pulled in front of me in the fast lane, I kid you not, I heard a voice say, move over into the slow lane. So I moved over into the slow lane. Ten seconds after that, a huge sofa fell off the back of that truck into that fast lane. Wow. Had I not moved, it would have at a, a gone at that high rate of speed. It's no telling what could have happened. And so uh, I, I remember going to my prayer closet after that and saying, God, what's going on here? It's, it's like we haven't we've had all these attacks with, related to cars and why automobiles? And mm. the thought dawned on me that what is the most dangerous thing we do every day? Drive. Yeah. Drive. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I would say that anyone who embarks on the uh, biblical initiative uh, to uh, uh, not only do spiritual warfare, to, but to empower and equip believers to do that, others to do that, then I would say then you're getting closer to the front lines. Hmm. As you get to the, close to the front lines of, of spiritual warfare, you're going to get more of the heat of the battle. And that's what my family and I face. Well, I do not have near about the, the, the ministry of deliverance that, that, that you have, but uh, we did do prayer appointments and, and stuff like that at our retreat center, my wife and I, Sandy and I, and uh, when I would go out of town, never failed, she would always have, you know, just, it, it, in some, you know, just, just warfare. And it was, it, and a lot of times, Steve, it was not huge things like what you were going through. It was just like little foxes, you know, and, those, and up Absolutely. those little... Those little foxes add up in a day, and you're like, you want to pull your hair out by the end of the day, and it or or this is a better uh, like a war the torture of a thousand different yeah. cuts, yeah. you know, like a thousand cuts, yeah, a thousand cuts, yeah, and uh, yeah, t- Lindsay can remember a lot of these stories. But what would you say to somebody who thinks you're woo woo because you see stuff that is really when it really is demonic? This demonic, they think that it was, you know. Let, let me rephrase this question better. All right. I, I have a friend who basically says that if, if it's God's will, it's, it's smooth sailing. If you're having a lot of problems, God doesn't want you to do it. And obviously, with the cosmology we talk about, that's just not true because we have a third party there, the enemy. And uh, so how would you answer someone like that, that, that uh, 
would say that, oh, well, you're getting opposition, you know, so it must not be the Lord, um, when it probably is most likely demonic. How would you handle that? Well, first thing I would say is that if that's the case, then the Apostle Paul would have never uh, went into ministry. Mm. Mm. Or he would have given up when he got to Ephesus. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Jesus would have actually said, Hey, this is too much. I'm not, I'm getting caned and I'm getting the 39 lashes minus one. Uh, this is this way too much. The prophets that we read about the hall of, of the cloud of witnesses and the hall of fame and the, in the book of Hebrews, Jeremiah, Elijah, the prophets, they, they were all given up. If, if, uh, them being obedient to God meant that they would, uh, if that, if that's true, uh, then they would have actually stopped doing ministry. And we would have a probably uh, two books in the Bible. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, most of Jesus' ministry was deliverance. It wasn't just healing. It was deliverance healing or it was deliverance oriented. And yeah, we, we'd have to play Thomas Jefferson rip most of the <laughs> most of the Gospels all up. And anyway, so, yeah, that's a great answer to, to tell people, because I do. I encounter that uh um, extreme, extreme sovereignty type stuff where people just think that uh, everything that happens, they, I, I've encountered several ministers that just, they would quit. And I'm like, no, don't quit. Press on. You might be towards, you never know. One more prayer might tip the, the, the bowls in heaven or, you, you know, and, and I'm like, my wife and I are just weird. We just don't give up. Uh, we've been doing discipleship ministry for 20 some odd years and and we just don't give up even when it doesn't work and and i don't know maybe we're maybe we're stubborn i think i would see the donkey underneath me by now if <laughs> if if i was that stubborn but uh yeah that's encouraging steve it's really absolutely and, and you know and, and not to sound insulting to anyone uh but the, there is an old adage out there is uh if satan isn't bothering you then he may not see you as a threat that's yeah, a, yeah i've heard of that one yep definitely be said yeah, the the big one I used to do, I used to send a meme to my wife all the time. It says it has these planes flying over. It says, When you're coming to the target, you encounter more enemy fire. So I'm like, Yeah, yeah I can dig that. Well, I, I uh one of the things too, I would you know, all no matter where people are in their faith background, they don't dismiss Ephesians six eleven where it says we wrestle not against flesh, flesh and, blood. and blood. Yeah. But one of the things I uh I try to remind people. Um, I, I guess I don't know if that's six or eleven. I know it's in Ephesians six. I, I, you know, I'm not. I don't have my Bible open in front of me, uh, of course. But, um, but one of the things it's actually, it's, I believe it's twelve. Um, yes, it's, uh, Ephesians six twelve. Now, the reason why I'm bringing it up because this is pretty significant. What people don't know, uh, a lot of times people say when they get attacked by demons, it's not uncommon. Like they talk about sleep paralysis, mm -hmm. or they feel like something's pressing down on them, or they get the choking. Do you know there is actually a biblical precedence for that? No. It's in Did you talk about that in the book? I don't remember. Uh, I did not talk about this. Is kind of okay. the stuff I didn't have yeah. in the book. <laughs> yeah. But it should have been footnoted. Yeah. In Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians uh, 6 and 12, they uses the word wrestle. But that word in the Greek, uh, in classical Greek, means to hold your opponent down uh, with your hand upon their neck. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, so when people say that, when they talk about sleep, they being they were demonically attacked, and they and at first it started with sleep paralysis, or they feel like something's pressing them into the mattress where they can't move, or they feel a hand around the neck. That mm -hmm. would actually that word wrestle actually comes from that. That is the root, uh, classical Greek use of it. Wow, that's, pinning that's... your opponent down on their back, uh, with you on top of them, and your hand around their neck. That's how you won the match. And that's what we hear predominantly in, in mm -hmm. most sleep paralysis type, particularly with the, the demons there and not just in the corner of the room or whatever. But uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's really fascinating. I'm not to remember that. I'm going to look up the Greek word and stuff. Um, so you have any more stories, war stories that uh, they didn't make the cut? I'm trying to, it's so many. Uh, and I wish, I really wish I could tell one that happened to me recently. Um, but I would have to get the person's permission for that. Mm, I, understand. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I wish, uh, and, and I believe it's in the third chapter because I have the, the 50 different true stories are spread throughout. Yeah. Uh, you'll notice when you read that chapter, I talk about, uh, that I was reading a, an ancient a exorcism prayer 
Uh, and then I had a very unique manifestation that night. And you'll notice that I do not, that's the only place where I do not footnote specifically what that exorcism prayer was. And I, and the reason why I did not do that is because I know that people out of curiosity would look it up and they would not know if they're not equipped, they, they would not know how to deal with some of the, the spiritual warfare or the demonic encounters they may face as a result of that. Uh, so a few times in the book, I do not specify some of the ancient rabbi who was a young rabbi who wanted to know if demons were real. So he did, a, he did an experiment. And you'll notice I did not specify what that experiment was because right. I did not want people trying to do that. So I've tried to be a little responsible. Uh, of course, the book is, I tried to write the, the narrative of the book in, on a high school level. And then, mm -hmm. of course, there are like 80 different sources and 400 footnotes. So yeah. that way, if people that wanted to do advanced reading, they could go and, and do that uh, and delve in a little deeper and not have to go back and research. I try to make it as easy as possible for people to do advanced research. But coming back full circle to your question about the stories, this is not in there. I, I can tell you that uh, there is a part of the book where I talk about biphasal sleep and its mm -hmm. contribution to what we call the bewitching hour. Yeah, three. Yeah, it's three. Very to... ancient. It's very, very ancient. That was probably one of the most shocking things for me to discover in my research is that up into the 1800s, and I'm going somewhere with this, by the way, it wasn't until the 1800s, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, that people practiced biphasal sleeping. And so pretty much people would go to bed naturally after sundown, and then they would awake at the midpoint of the night. So for us, we have a fixed mid midpoint. We call it, you know, 12 midnight. But in the ancient world, the midpoint of the night was six hours after sundown. And so that was the midpoint or midnight for the ancient world. And that's where you get the bewitching hour and they express it is historically for thousands of years we find in history, that is when demonic activity is at its highest rate. As a matter of fact, in the so psychological uh, journals, you can also discover that homicide and suicide and violent crimes are high during that hour as well. Mm -hmm. And so when I started doing that research, I remember right afterwards, uh, God waking me up during the bewitching hour, the midpoint of the night uh, and saying, hey, you need to pray for, I felt an urgency to pray for my bloodline. That's the that's how it was impressed upon me. Hmm. First night I did it, I prayed for my bloodline, interceded. Um, and we didn't talk about fasting. I think somebody brought that up and I can go back to that if we have the time. But the second night I felt an urgency to get up again and, and do intercessory prayer for, for my bloodline. And when I started praying, and <laughs> people can believe this or not, it was about a, an 11 foot demon manifested in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. I believe and it. he began to write on the dark, uh, the air of the night. And he kind of started spelling out with his fingers, this is going to happen. Wow. And pretty much what he was warning me, uh, he said, he could do, you can do all the intercessory prayer you want, but if your loved ones are not uh, repentant, I, I am going to attack them. It's just a matter of time. Hmm. And so I can say, uh, you know, we, we see examples of Moses doing intercessory fasting in the Old Testament. God wanted to destroy the Israelites because of their re re reverting back to paganism, uh, the worship of the golden calf, and, and Moses interceded. Mm -hmm. And so we find also Jesus, the new covenant Moses, who does the same. He goes out into the wilderness and he fasts. You say, well, why does Jesus need to fast? He doesn't. We needed him to fast. Mm -hmm. and we, we needed his example and we needed his intercession. And he still, to this day, intercedes for us. Uh, we're grateful to have a, a God who loves us that much. Mm. That's fascinating that that's happened to you, Steve, uh, especially at 3 a.m. You know, you, you did well to call it the witching hour. Mm -hmm. But I've always found that the enemy likes to take the things that are sanctified, glorified, and holy, and flip them for their own dark and sinister reasons. And I'm often remembered and reminded when somebody mentions that they've had some kind of event at 3 a.m. 
that the best event happened at 3 p.m. on a Friday. That's right. 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. And that mm. was the crucifixion, the death of Christ. Amen. I mean, yeah. won our souls for, for the kingdom of heaven. You know, I've been a Christian for a long time. Never thought about it like that. I never thought yeah. that. 3-3. Like, three, three. That, that's, that's, that sounds like his M.O., definitely. Anything holy, let's make it unholy. Yep. So. Absolutely, I, and I, I totally agree with the uh, Satan taking the inverse, yeah, and 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 and, and doing combat uh, accordingly. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there's all those. All those are there's a lot of things that happen in the middle of the night. Uh, we wake up. We wake up hungry. You know, the opposite of fasting is gluttony. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, all these things are we're, we're tempted in the middle of the night for a reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. And you find prayer books uh, not only in uh, the years, centuries prior to uh, Christ, uh, but you also find them in like in the 1800s, uh, where there were Christians were still praying, arising during the middle of the night to pray. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, that's where I didn't bring that out in the book. I believe that's why David uh, David talks about waking up at the midpoint of the night to pray and praise God. So the three times to pray uh, could have been actually the start of your day, uh, then right before the end of your day, uh, right at sundown, et cetera, or before you go to bed, and then right at the midpoint of the night. Those are maybe in the three times of prayer because we can show scriptural evidence of the fact that David uh, prayed at the middle of the night. And fascinatingly, we find also... Uh, uh, in the book of Acts, when Peter is released from prison, it's during the midpoint of the night when they're mm. praying. Also, when Jesus is walking on the water, it's the midpoint of the night. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. 3 a.m. Yeah. That's the best day. Yeah. The best day. 3 a.m. Yep. You also have the, the trials at noon with the noonday devils, as David writes in, I think, Psalm 90. Mm-hmm. And it's it's particularly, I think, the demon of sloth, I think, is the the main enemy in that situation. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah, I know in the in the the tradition I'm in that we have morning and evening prayer, and then you have something called Compline, which is usually when you go to bed, but it could be double as a perhaps a night office. Um, so yeah, the church has traditionally prayed like that, but we're so afraid of being ritualistic that we don't do anything. Yeah, that's, that's, and I, I'm not, I'm not coming from a place of everything should be ritualized. I, I don't agree with that because it, beca- it becomes rote, but, uh, yeah, there's so much rich tradition, in, like you said, in 2000 years of church that we've, uh, we, uh, you know, me being saved Baptist and, and going to the Methodist church and then vineyard and finally Anglican. I'm kind of a mutt spiritually, but I, I've I've really imbibed a lot of the the richness of the tradition of the church in, in um, all these years, and particularly like what you said about the whole demonic thing. And I love mm-hmm. that whole historical aspect that you brought up in your book. That just made it that much better. It really laid a good foundation for um, for for what you were trying to say. Instead of a lot of a lot of deliverance books are just all practical, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we need practical, but you, you know, uh, Paul wrote his letters theological, then practical, and and I appreciate that about your book. It really yeah. kind of sucked sucked me in, and then gave me things to do. So, no, Amen. that's perfect. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I actually tried to uh, have some balance to the book. Uh, you know, yeah. I talked about the first part. I talk about my personal encounters. Yeah. And then, of course, the middle point, I talk about biblical insights because I kind of want to lay a biblical foundation for the stories to come. Yeah. Because when I deal with the last section on pastoral experiences, uh, that way, when people read them, they can say, well, where is he getting this from? They can go back. If they're familiar with the earlier chapters, they can say, oh, I see a biblical, there's a biblical uh, precedence for this mm-hmm. experience. And so I tried to empower or equip the, you know, the reader to, to know that, hey, you can have confidence in, in, in your, your ability to successfully 
confront evil spirits um, or contend with them, you know, as as needed uh, because of uh, your your rich heritage and and of course ultimately what Christ did on the cross when he disarmed the Satan and his entire army, Colossians two fifteen. And I, I even share chapter seventeen. You talk about the snake or the cobra, literally a god that fully manifested into a snake form. And there was another chaplain present who did that. Mm-hmm. And, and so I made sure he was in the book. I got his permission to be in that chapter so that people can say, hey, this is eyewitness accounts. I'm not just telling you this to sell a book. I'm, I got eyewitnesses yeah. to this. And it sorted out what triggered the, the manifestation or the demon surfacing is when I quoted, I started quoting Colossians 2.15. I couldn't even finish. Wow. And he fully manifested the demon fully. Man- I mean, the guy started contorting spine, you know, concaving and popping and mm. and his lips, the corner of his lips going all the way back to his earlobes almost. Mm. Yeah, that was particularly disturbing for me when I read it. <laughs> yeah, it creeped me out. <laughs> it really did. But that's what he's yeah. doing. Satan loves to show off. And that, yep, that's what he was doing. Trying to scare fear. Um. Because you had the most powerful name in the world on your lips, I'm sure. So, <laughs> and I just had—I I was still uh, in a sling. I just had shoulder surgery, wow. and I was almost knee to knee with this guy when this was unfolding. And and uh, but I didn't—I didn't go there in my power. Right. I went there in the power of Christ, and and I was fully with all of that happening in front of me. I was fully confident in the power of Christ and the promise that He gives in Luke ten. Uh, 19, where he says that all the power of the enemy is, you know, will not harm you. Um, and he's given us authority and power over, over evil spirits and, and they cannot harm us in the process of us expelling demons. And, and so I was, I was just really confident and I saw the power of God, his name, man, that is a powerful name. And Amen. we have this great name. He has, uh, he has given us his name to use and ex. What a gift. And this is why I really sense God's heart that he does not want his people suffering. He does not want, us, want his people suffering. He doesn't want any human suffering from Satan and his, and his demons. And so for us to, to not know of this and we sit on, on this great power and authority that and ability that God has given us, I think in the end of days, it'll be one of the greatest travesties that we'll talk about in all of eternity is that we fail to use God's name to its full capacity. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we have anything to do with it, all of us, it won't be that case. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, get the, the good news out. Well, let, let me ask you, Steve, obviously your book going to be coming out soon. Do you have a date for that? It's actually next Tuesday, uh, the all 23rd. Right. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. Is it going to be Audible? Can I listen to it too? Do you know? Absolutely. You can get it on Audible. You can get it uh, paperback. If you go with the paperback, and you order uh, the, through the publisher, Baker Books, you can get it for $11. It's 40% off with free shipping. I'm excited. God gave me this opportunity. Yeah. And This is a God message, Steve. It really is. When I got this book, you know, we get books from people, publishers and stuff like that. And, and I started reading. I'm like, no, I actually like dig this book. This book is good. you know. And, and so where else can they find you? I would say the easiest way to find me, you can go to my website and I kind of may try to make it simple. I played around beta tests and a bunch of names, but the one I went with is there's a lot of Steve Dabs out there. Some of them are like biochemists. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, I don't know how that happened. But uh, so I was stuck with uh, I am Steve Dabs dot com. And so okay. if they so they, if they go to I am Steve Dabs dot com. Uh, that'll take them to my website, and then there they could actually contact me. Uh, another way to do it is they type in the title of the book, uh, WhenDemonsSurface.com. Okay. Uh, WhenDemonsSurface.com. It actually bring them to the website as well. Okay. Well, we're going to put all these links on the show notes, but I just want you to uh, say it and get it out there for everybody. Well, Steve, uh, we thank you so much for being on our show. Um, I appreciate you taking the time, and uh, this was... Wow. If I got anything from this book, it was just the renewed pursuit of, number one, trying to be spiritually prepared for demonic attack, but also just the Lord's Prayer. That that was huge, yeah. huge for me, and, and, and as an actual act of deliverance. So, But thank you so much, Steve. 
Absolutely. Yes. The honor is mine. I'm just an unworthy servant. I know all of us are. And we're just trying to do our best to do God's duty. And so the honor is mine. And thank you for having me today. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank man. you for coming on. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.